Welcome everyone to the CCA Jewelry Metal Arts Fall 2021 BFA Conversations. My name is Curtis Hidamasa Nickerson Arima. I'm the chair of the Jewelry Metal Arts Program. I'm joining you from California College of the Arts, located in Huchin and Yalamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, on the unceded territories of the Chechenyo and Ramachush Ohlone people. I encourage you all to discover the rich cultures of the indigenous people and the places you occupy and where your ancestors are from. As we start, I'd like to honor these original stewards of the land, welcome you all, honor our ancestors, those who are with us today and those who have passed on. Today, we have four amazing jewelry metal arts BFA candidates to hear from and learn about their work. Umang Wu, Dasi, Cheng Jie Jin, Bowie Chan, Ursula, Wei Xing Hong. Uh, we are all so proud of these artists. They have continued their education with dedication, determination through so many unusual circumstances. We are in con a continued pandemic. Umang has braved a major flood in China. There's been a global economic challenges and there have been international social uprisings of many kind. Each of these artists is each of these artists use these challenges and experiences that we face as inspiration to create work. They simultaneously describe and dispel some of the trauma from our time through crafting objects, photographs, performance, and videos. These students are resourceful. They've built their home studios, connected with resources in their home countries, and are consistently developing their artwork forward, regardless of the circumstances, resources, and their locations. We are across the globe today. Dasi is here in California, Bowie in Hong Kong, and Umang and Ursula in mainland China. It's a privilege to have witnessed these uh, progressions of their artworks. I'm so sad that we couldn't be here together in person this semester, but I'm happy that we can gather virtually today. I'm joined by former chair and longtime faculty member, Marilyn De Silva. We will be introducing the presenters. They will each have 10 minutes to present and Olivia Shi will be leading discussions after each presentation for about 10 minutes. Although we will not have time for audience video participation today, I encourage you all to write affirmations and congratulations in the chat for presenters to see. I'd like to introduce Olivia Shi. Olivia is a contemporary jeweler, artist, and writer based in Oakland, California. Born in the US and raised in Taiwan, she is interested in the cultural nuances that can be explored through wearable sculpture. She's earned two bachelors of fine arts, one in creative writing from Columbia University and the other in jewelry metal arts from CCA. In addition to her running her eponymous jewelry business, Olivia writes for Metalsmith Magazine and Art Jewelry Forum. Welcome, Olivia. Uh, Marilyn De Silva will be introducing our first two presenters. Marilyn's work has been displayed nationally and internationally, including, including the Victoria Albert Museum in London, the National Gallery of Australia. Her work has been featured in numerous books, magazines, and catalogs. She's been recognized to be Master Metalsmith by the National Ornamental Muse Metals Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. She also received the honor of being selected as a fellow of the American Craft Council. Welcome, Marilyn. She'll be introducing our first presenter. Hello, everyone. This is really an exciting time for us to, <clears throat> excuse me, honor our wonderful graduating seniors. It's a bittersweet time. We're, we're so proud of all of you. I'm introducing Yuming Wu, who was born in Chengzhou, China. Her first experience with jewelry was early. Her childhood was filled with her parents' collection of jade. She found it interesting to see jade jewelry worn on the body. When she came to the JMA studio with her love of jewelry, she discovered that metal could be a medium to multiply in and convey her spirit and become her language. She has expressed how the JMA studio and CCA have been a significant influence on her and helped her find her confidence. I asked Yuming to 
explain to us what she hopes to convey to the viewers with her work. She explained, quote, I think for me, jewelry is the spiritual embodiment of the creator and the owner. It's also an intermedia for my emotional expression and a medium to convey it to the world. I wanted to find the balance between art and fashion to blur the boundaries between them. Probably because of the environment I grew up in, I'm not good at expressing my emotions to others. So my jewelry has become my pen and my mouth. I like to deep my emotions into the events that I hear, see, or experience, and then blur the barrier between reality and imagination to convey my thoughts to the audience. Please welcome Yumeng Wu and experience the fascinating world that she has created. Hello. So let me share my screen. Hi, I'm Yumeng Wu from Jewelry and Mental Arts major. Growing up in China and studying U.S. has made me an observer of life, which contributes to my work as a narrative and emotional poetry of what I say. Jewelry is my pen and mouth. It's a materialization of spiritual aspects and the work of the catharsis of emotions. I will present three series of my works that are inspired a group story, Rebirth, My Story, My Own Peach Blossom Supreme, Someone's Story, by Sanders. Rebirth begins with the witness of a female friend who has been influenced and changed by her growing environments. This led to my observation and reflection on how environments subtly change the female behavior and the community thoughts. Series are numerous, ordinary, and tenacious plants with vitality that die off when they are out of water but resurrected when back in the water again. Each color in the performance represents a force from the outside world, and the seaweed represents the female. I made a dye from the seaweed and pour the seaweed on the model's body. It's like different factories that hit females at different times and in the different ways during their development. It's like an army that confines and protects people. It's a process of mutual achievement and adornment. The rejuvenated civet become jewelry worn on the body, and its color is released into the surrounding water, decorating itself and the surrounding environment. Thank you. 
When the dyed seaweed meets the sweat, the color will be stained on the skin. External communities will affect the person connected and leave some traces that cannot be erased. If the person is strong enough, she can turn the outside influence into her own trees and see the traces left as decoration. If she is not strong enough, the traces left behind will be will have a performative impact. I then designed a bright lake to reproduce the performance to the small scale as well as make the seaweeds wearable. The water and the seaweeds inside the sharking vessel are like ghost experience. I, may, I wish my work to learn the audiences to face their memories, hang on, and then release the, the emotions for the public to understand the shooting effect. The initial inspiration for this collection came from my memories of being a misfit in secondary school. At this time, I was introduced to the Peach Blossom Supreme by Tao Yuanming. The poem describes a nebulous utopia discovered by chance, where people live an ideal life in harmony with nature, ignorant of the outside world for the centuries. Everyone says that the peach blossom spray represents an escape from world, but I don't think so. It's until I become a, a American student with a new life situation, I began to try to decipher what kind of emotional that I need. This brooch is the materialization of peach blossom spray in my consciousness. This piece tells the story of a supernaturally character who lived in a ground in ancient Chinese Han Dynasty legend. He appears out of now here and uh, cares everyone. Fu Zhu is a supernatural being from the ancient Chinese mythology book, The Shanghai Jing. I have always imagined what it would look like and what the story would be. Since I came to CCA, I have made a piece about Fuzhou every year. Uh, it has become a poetry to my world and has grown up with me. I was inspired by incident of school bullying that my friends suffered in our high school. Well, the other students were indifferent bystanders. I was a special kind of bystander. I wanted to help her, but here was nothing I could to speak up. I hope that my work will tell our memory and the story to the audiences and uh, encourage them to be brave enough to help the victim. Due to the time limit, I can introduce more. And uh, I want to say the model also the victim of this work is in our Zoom right now. This is a special gift for her. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Yumong. Oh, am I? Thank you so much, Yumong. Um, we're going to start our uh, correspondence with Olivia now. Hi, Yumong. I just wanted to say congratulations on your work. I was really impressed. Um, especially with your performance and the video that you put together of the uh, piece with the seaweed. I feel like I haven't seen a lot of seaweed 
um, incorporated into artwork yet. And this could be something you could explore further or it might down the road evolve into something signature that's part of your signature look. I would love to see even more work from you incorporating the seaweed. And um, I was also really impressed by the amount of detail and attention paid to everything that you constructed. And I could see that you spent a good amount of time doing research, whether it was through like literature or like different plants. Um, and that was very interesting to me. And um, another thing was that I really appreciated your kind of skilled usage of semi-transparent materials and then also reflection of light. I feel like that brought a lot of interest to your pieces. And um, I was wondering, what is what are your plans after graduation? Um, my plan go to the master's school to uh, spend more time to find my what kind of uh, what jewelry for me and uh, what kind of jewelry I want to design and make. So, are you interested in exploring more performance art or more jewelry related to the body? I want to both because I try I try to find a balance between the jewelry, uh, jewelry art jewelry and the fashion. Mm -hmm. So, um, I. I I spend more I spend a lot of a lot of time on uh philosophy uh, philosophy and the psychological to uh try to find answer for my design so I want to try uh combine my plans combine the performance and the uh the final piece together and the, uh I, I the mental piece will be my uh final work but before the mental piece I want to use another material or way to. Uh, explore my uh, feeling and emotion. I think that's a that's a great idea to use different types of materials to experiment and like figure out which exactly fits your emotion best. Um, it's great to keep open minded and just try everything out there. I did see like that wide range of materials that you used, and I was really impressed by that too. Um, and. I was interesting to hear that you're interested in fashion. Can you tell me more about why that draws you in? Why fashion draws you in? Um, because uh, I uh, I um, my parents like like jewelry, Chinese jewelry, traditional uh, style, and uh, I hear a lot of a lot of people tell me like tra traditional jewelry is not a like fashion jewelry. It can't. Uh, go to uh go to the inter uh, international like world, so I want to go by my uh, like big memory and uh, like try to find why uh traditional Chinese jade are not fashion or can be fashion jewelry in our world. So um, I want to transfer more different material to the fashion jewelry. So it's why I'm interested in fashion. Got it. Um, I I'm also very curious about um, the relationship between your culture and jade. I would love to see maybe in the future a piece of work where you can incorporate that somehow in, into your dialogue. And um, thinking about all the pieces you did, especially from the, I think was the bystander piece, all the pieces were related to the face or the ears, the mouth. Um, I think you could look at the artist um, Judith Fritz, and I will send these names to Curtis so you can look them up. Um, she's a Swedish artist, and she does a lot of things related to the face using like wires and pearls. And then there's also Polina Osipova, who is a Russian artist, and she kind of straddles the line between fashion and art more. And she's had collaborations with like Vogue and I think other fashion magazines. Um, that might be an interesting place, person for you to look at. And then um, have you heard of the artist Lauren Coleman? Um, no. she, she started out in the metals and jewelry field. I think she's expanded more into interaction performance and sculpture now, but she has a lot of pieces that have to do with the mouse, the mouth, the face, and um, 
your work reminded me of her work. And then I think finally, there's one more person, Ron Miski, um, who also incorporates a lot of metal and different materials having to do with the face and expression. Um, I felt that the piece Bystander was very strong for me. It um, was very emotive and I wanted to like see the piece up close. And um, Thank you so much. I think that's, <laughs> and um, do you have any questions for me or? Anything at all? No, no, thank you for your help, Nathan. Yeah, yeah no problem. Um, congratulations again. That was a very impressive body of work. Thank you. Great, thank you, Olivia and Umang. Um, Marilyn is now going to um, introduce the next presenter. Hello again. I'm introducing Zhang Ji Jin, who we know as Dasi. She was born in Suzhou, Jiangsu, China. Dasi was always interested in making things since she was a child. When she first learned how to solder a ring, it amazed her that metal could be joined without glue. That and the ability to make wearables with metal ignited her interest in jewelry metal arts. A trend known as Lolita fashion has influenced her work and her fashion sense. This combined with her fascination of vintage items and oddities, both cute and eerie, can be seen in her work. When asked what she would like the viewer to take from her work, she says, quote, Inspired by my childhood memories and love of vintage objects, I have created a dreamland for adults using metal as their foundation. My intent is to create a safe landing for adults to escape from reality, opening up their imaginations and releasing their inner child. I believe childhood is one of the most important periods in one's life. These early experiences continue to impact us throughout adulthood, shaping our personalities and value systems. I want to remind people of their happy memories. Please join Dassey as she introduces us to her wonderful fantasy world. Thank you, Marilyn. That's very sweet. Um, I'll be sharing my screen here. Mm. Can you guys see it? Okay. Mm, hi, my name is Chen Jieting, and I prefer to be called Desi. I was raised and born in Suzhou, Jiangsu, China. And I, just like everyone else, I've always been interested in art. Um, but kind of different from others is that I found that I really love making things compared to painting and drawing. Um, I slowly making everything with different materials. Even while I was in class during middle school, I always get caught by teacher but that's what I'm interested in. So while I was using different materials, I slowly discovered metal. I was amazed by the characteristic of metal. I can connect metal in different ways without the use of glue. And metal can be preserved for a long time and used to make wearables. And just like Marilyn said, Lolita fashion influenced myself and my style a lot, even though you might not be able to tell directly through my piece, but as you can see what I'm wearing, I definitely really love Lolita fashion. So I have been in love with this style for more than five years now. It is an important part of who I am. Many people even can recognize me just because of the dress I'm wearing in the studio. Mm, Mirko Kusamoto's work inspires me a lot, a lot, especially her metal work before she started to work with textile and fabric. In her work, she uses a lot of boxes and components filled with curiosities. They're playful, changeable, and eccentric. I love how her work encouraged people to imagine while discovering. Just like how Mirko Kusumoto's work is, I'm also, very, I'm also influenced by my childhood memories. 
Inspired by my childhood memories and love of vintage objects, I have created a dream land for adults. Using metal as their foundation, my intent is to create a safe landing for those to escape from reality, opening up their imagination and relieve their inner child. I believe childhood is one of the most important periods of one's life. These early experiences continue to impact us throughout adulthood, shaping our personalities and value systems. I want to remind people of their happy memories, the loves we shared at the circus with our loved ones, the meal, enjo the meal enjoyed around the family dinner table, the beloved stuffed animals we held tight through the night that are all important memories that keep us positive and grounded. Though we may not be able to run away from the pressure and stress we must all face as adults, we can create a safe place that only belongs to ourselves, a place where we can calm down and heal. I'm inspired by vintage objects because they also have a story to tell. Instead of letting them be forgotten and left behind, I bring them back to life, giving them new meaning and purpose. Vintage toys, medical instruments, and graphics become the starting point for an idea. I then use metal to fabricate the dreamland from my imagination to create my little world. While working, I search for balance between cute and airy. I include but transform the airy elements into things that are the life for and heartwarming. I want to surprise people with the unexpected, changing their initial bias initiated by each object's formal life. By combining these materials with metal, I transform them into jewelry and sculpture, allowing adults to enjoy the pure happiness of playing with toys, while also providing a safe place for them to escape and relieve their past innocence. Mm, I created six different pieces, transforming these words into physical objects. I created a set of circus toys inspired by three ring circuses using vintage images from the 19th century. There are different animal parts where you can place on the circus ring based on your desire. Fresh hot popcorn, Malcolm cotton candy, refreshing ice soda, the circus is a place that carries many people's happy memory. It is a fun place where everyone enjoys themselves with their loved ones. I remember the last time, the last and the only time I went to a circus was with my homestay in England. It was such an unforgettable experience that happened when I was 12. Now I bought this experience back home with me, keeping it close with myself again. Circus trip is not the only experience that I miss. In fact, I miss the homemade food that I used to be able to have every night while I was living with my family. This is called Home to Home. It is a dining room jewelry set. This piece contains my memory related to my homes. Through the French window in the background, we can see the Bay Bridge and the most famous building in my hometown, the gate to the east. This window connects my home here in Oakland to my home back in Suzhou. In Chinese culture, family members need to gather and eat at the same table every night. Sadly, I did not have a, ch I did not have a chance to meet any of my family members for the last two and a half years because of coronavirus. So this piece shows my vision of home and contains my wish to gather with my family in the near future. The chair beside the table can be taken out and worn as a set of earrings. The dining table in the middle it, of the piece is cut out from a vintage Polly Pocket toy and it can be worn as a ring. The box as a whole can be worn as a necklace or it can also be the home of the ring and earrings when they're not in use. Though I do not have my family members to stay with me while I'm here alone in the state, my stuffed animal keep me positive and grounded. That time is one of the most important times for me. It gives me time to stay alone and rethink everything that happened today. Beginning in middle school, I always have stuffed animal to help me with my sleep. I've changed my stuffed animal a few times during my life, so each different stuffed animal represents each different part of me. I decided to make three different necklaces to represent these different stuffed animals I owned during middle school, high school, and college. By wearing these necklaces, I can bring these important buddies with me during daytime, even the one that is in my home back in China. The different color of beads represents the color of the stuffed animal. By making unbalanced necklaces, I can bring those charms closer to the left part of my body so they're closer to my heart. And three of the different strings of beads represent the cozy feeling while staying with them in bed. By making them into production pieces, it allows me to share these buddies with everyone. Sadly, sometimes the society won't allow you to be the real you. In the current society, we have cliche ideas around women. We have many expectations on how, wom how a woman is supposed to be like. Women need to be slim and pretty. Woman needs to be mature and it's part of our responsibility to take care of our family and our house. We're forced to face the pressure from the society requiring us to do all this work. It is almost impossible for us to spare some time to take care of ourselves and be the real us. 
I made this purse combining my understanding of woman and girl together by using a by using the look of a modern purse with a cute girly insert. I wish this mini purse will remind adults their innocence, providing them a moment for them to slow down and feel safe. To create my dreamland, I'm also inspired by vintage objects and I enjoy combining them into my design. I first found this broken vintage doll in an abandoned box beside the road. He lost an arm and his clothes were torn apart. I picked him back home and tried to repair him. I created a set of tentacle inspired jewelry that will fit into his body to transform his incompleteness into another kind of beauty. Though this, though this reparation turned him into a hybrid, I kept his paws the best I can while leading him into a new future. Now he has another chance to be loved by a new owner. These tentacle parts can be worn as a set of jewelry, including a ring, a necklace, a brooch, and a set of earrings. They can be stored back in the door when they are not in use. Not only vintage dolls, but I also drew inspiration from vintage medical devices. I created this piece during quarantine with this fun vintage glass range. Instead of expecting cold liquid coming out from this scary syringe, it is a warm, comfy yarn that will bring us hope and heal us emotionally. A sweet living room scene was created inside the syringe with cut out potty pocket toy parts that I used in my previous piece. A ring is also included in the syringe so that it can be worn while knitting. The easily accessible spoon knitting allows everyone to experience this piece. The repetitive motion of knitting calms users down and gives them a relaxing sensation. During this hard time of coronavirus, we need to change our cliche idea related to syringes and get vaccinated to keep everyone safe. And so those are the six pieces I created for my senior thesis. And after I graduate, I will continue making jewelry work, especially customized wearable for my family. Uh, and I also wanna be more focusing on production pieces so I can make profit. I also have other designs that I want to create sharing the similar idea that I have in my senior thesis. This sketch is one of those, uh, one of the idea I have, which is a locket. And thank you for everyone who supported me during my senior year. Special thanks to my teacher, Curtis Depp, Marilyn and Russell. And my photographer, Dong Ling, was my model and photo assistant, Beverly. And, and thank you for all the support from my friends and family. And here are all my contact information, and you can find me through any of these. Oh, and by the way, don't forget to come to my in-person senior show. I will have it open during Wednesday to, Thursday, Wednesday to Friday next week in Oliver Arts Center in Oakland campus. Yeah. I wish to see you guys there and come, please come and say hi to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jassy. Um, <laughs> that was so fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, please come to her exhibition. She has these amazing installations she has. Uh, with furniture and um, and her pieces. So it's on the Oakland campus and it runs all next week. So please come visit. Um, now we're gonna invite Olivia to respond to Dassey's work. Thank you. Hi Dassey. Hi. Um, so that was a really well-prepared presentation. I love seeing all the images and your sketches and the ideas behind each of the pieces. And um, there was a lot of, especially for their circus piece, exquisite colored pencil coloring happening and a lot of precise fabrication, which I really appreciated. And I feel like there is a lot of sort of nostalgia for childhood and um, Lolita fashion kind of toys that is woven into your work. And I think nostalgia is a very, um, it's a topic for, with a lot of potential to explore for you in the future. Um, there are a lot of artists who work with nostalgia and I just wanted to mention a few so you could look them up. So first of all, there's Hannah Oatman and I think she graduated from RISD a few years ago, but what she does was she, she would take these toys, kind of the colors of toys from her youth and then turn them into pieces that you could Put together so you can kind of pick the ones you like and then put them together and there would be like pastel colored pieces or like pieces with glitter or stars in them and that 
your work kind of reminds me of her work, like bringing that kind of joyfulness, joyful nostalgia back into the world. And then there is also um, Melanie Belenker. I don't know if you know her, but she actually takes her own hair and she turns it into these little small miniature drawings of like everyday life and intimate moments in life. And I think she works with a microscope, so she cuts her hair and then she puts it into small lines. So from afar, you can't tell it's actually hair, but up close, you can tell it's like little bits of hair. And that kind of like links into your, um, how you enjoy vintage items and like the cameo you had in that living room, I think, the box with the ring, the ring with a box on it. There was like a Victorian cameo on the wall. So having those like vintage elements and working it into something new. So if you look at Melanie Belenker's work, I think it would be very interesting to you. And um, what else did I want to mention? So I was really drawn to the purse that you made that had that very minimal modern look on the outside and lace on the inside, sort of showing the contrast of expectations that are put onto women. Um, and I feel like that was like a very successful piece because it combined two opposing ideas and kind of found sort of this uh, amalgamation or a combination of all these different ideas. And then also it was a small purse, which I think is like very on trend this season. Um, I've seen a lot of like really, really small purses going around that you can't even put your phone in. <laughs> and they're kind of like this show of luxury and beauty and fashion all in the same thing. And I think your piece really matched up with that nicely. So there are parts of like fashion and art and your different concepts. So that piece to me really drew me in. And also I think your the vintage doll that you had that you made like a doll hybrid out of, that was also very um, compelling to me. I feel as if you gave that doll really a whole new life. And there was this like, the, the octopus tentacles kind of hinted at a much more complex narrative behind the doll's life. And it also encourages the wearer to interact with the doll really nicely. And it has that kind of eclectic aesthetic that you um, showed us that was, that that Japanese artist made. I don't remember her name. Maruko Kusumoto? Yeah, she she would use all of these like vintage elements and put it, put it all together and it really fit together, right? It created this cohesive feeling of like curiosity and mystery. And I feel like that piece, the doll hybrid, really um, expressed that kind of aesthetic and emotion. And um, I did also want to mention that the, the ring you had with a small scene on it, I really like the sentiment behind it. And I like seeing all the different elements, like the chair ring and the things like that. But all together, it was a little bit, a li just a little bit confusing to me because there were so many different styles all together. And I think maybe you could unify it a bit more if you added a little more color that brought it all together or maybe different materials that somehow brought it more together but otherwise that was um it was very interesting to see you bring various elements from your life and put it all into one scene and I feel like that is one of your strengths bringing very different items or opposite items and putting it together somehow and it has and then it ends up making sense instead of just like being confusing. But um, I want to congratulate you again on just like really fabulous work. And I think there was one more thing. Oh, I wanted to ask you, why are you drawn to Lolita fashion? Like what, what's interesting about it? Oh, thank you for the question. Um, I think I was first attracted to it while I was in high school. While I was in high school, I think I was like, going through a lot in like because I transferred into another, another school and then it kind of hit me hard. So I feel like by wearing this kind of cuteness, it kind of protects me and also bring me back to the comfort zone while I was still a kid. So and I and I also I really love the um, local cosmology fashion. And I think 
one of the most important thing about Lolita fashion is not to wear it to pleasure the others, is to wear it to pleasure yourself. You wear mm -hmm. what you want to wear and you're not wearing it to attract anyone or attract any man, especially, where you're just uh, like, you're wearing it to show your taste and show your fashion style. So I really love that idea. So that was so interesting to me, uh, you talking about why you're drawn to Lolita fashion. Um, I don't know that much about Lolita fashion, but I know the word Lolita comes from the book Lolita. And it is a very controversial book. It has its very dark, dark sides to it. And I think it would be so interesting if you brought maybe dark elements into your own work as well, like giving that kind of contrast, because you're talking about these happy, light, joyful emotions, but without the dark side, it doesn't pop out as much. There's not as much of a contrast. So I think it would it would be great to see, like in maybe in your future work, you bringing in some of the dark side and some of the light side and like mixing it together. Thank you. That is part of my dream. Uh, yeah, while I was <laughs> taking the picture for the octopus tentacle set, mm -hmm. I, I, I should totally wear something more like on the scary part rather than on the sweet part. But yeah, that is my dream. Thank you for mentioning I it. I actually thought that photo shoot worked really well because mm -hmm. the, the tentacles are kind of dark. Oh, I see. Yeah. It's yeah. Like contrast. So it kind of draws out the dark parts of childhood, I guess. It's kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, how children they have great imaginations, but the imaginations can bring them to kind of scary things or, you know, sad things. And that kind of, that worked really well for me, actually, that photo shoot. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And congratulations again. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Olivia and Dassey. That was great. Um, so now I have, let me, change this one second. Great, I have the pleasure of introducing Bowie. Um, Bowie Chan was born and raised in Hong Kong. She first became interested in jewelry in 2016 when she signed up for an elective course in Salt Lake City Community College. Uh, she's drawn to the wearability of jewelry and the possibilities of interactions and reactions that the jewelry creates when worn in public. She's inspired by the versatility of the techniques of hammering and piercing metal in particular. Hammering allows her to create plays of light on the surfaces that catch the attention of the viewer and the wearer. Piercing and metal allows her to reduce the weight of the forms and adds patterns that are delicate while referencing protection or even threat. She strives for her work to have this dichotomy of curvy and sharp. Bowie says, I embrace femininity. I think women have, have to be tough in order to protect themselves from the difficulties that the world gives us. Um, Bowie, I know you've moved through and overcome many challenges during your time at CCA, and I congratulate you for all the work you've done and your continued educational path. Welcome, Thank Bowie. You. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. This is Bowie. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, Um, first of all, I want to thank Curtis for introducing me. You did a great job. Um, and here's the presentation I've prepared for you guys today. As Curtis has said, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, and I, have, I had lived in the U.S. for more than five years. I'm into jewelry, makeup, and black and white photography. I like to create things that I can wear and see them being worn on people who appreciate the things I create. My work often look feminine and edgy. They present the dual nature of femininity, the softness and a toughness. I embrace femininity, so I enjoy using curves to show soft traits from women, like their empathy, sensitivity, tenderness, beauty, and body. And I like to use tapered or sharp edges to show the tough traits like and, uh, intelligence, devotion, persistence, and the hard experiences 
with getting through life. And also to create a shield to protect oneself and others from the difficulties the world gives us. This mentality of being a tougher self as a woman did not just come from nowhere. There were some traumas in the past that have shaped me as the person I am right now. They were painful and unforgettable. They have turned my world upside down. My world was cold and dark. It took me everything to find the lights again, uh, the lights in life again. And now I feel like I've been reborn. The dark is behind me now and I will never look back. For that reason, I wanna use my last project at CCA to talk about the journey of healing from depression. And here is the art artist statement for my project. From the moth to the butterfly. For one who endures trauma, suffering from depression, the most painful part is often not the trauma itself, but rather the long process of finding balance, harmony, and happiness once again. It takes time and strength to help heal, and not everyone is capable of finishing this journey. Some people do not feel strong enough to keep going and pushing through. Instead, they allow me. Uh, instead, they allow the flame of sadness, anxiety, or grief to burn them alive. Slowly losing control over their lives by never letting go of the past, like a moth flying toward to a flame. They allow themselves to be consumed by the situation. Emotional turmoil represents the form of affliction one can confront and defeat entirely only by themselves. No other person, however empathetic, can win this battle for somebody else. For those who keep fighting and pushing through, the journey is never easy. The healing process is full of ups and downs, but once a person is fully, re uh, fully recovers, they can find peace and inner balance once again. While it is impossible to become the person they once were, it is possible to find a new normal, to find a renewed and stronger version of oneself, like a butterfly symbolizes transformation and rebirth in the course of a transition from one life form to the next, as in from a caterpillar to a butterfly. I created a series of five pieces of jewelry and sculptures. They are trauma, agony, I'm okay, recovery, and reborn. The first piece, trauma. Depression often comes from traumas. And I believe everyone of you would agree with me that traumas can do damages to your heart even though they're not physical. I wrote a quote when I was going through some trauma in the past. The heartbreak feels like a thousand needles puncturing my heart. And I use this quote as my inspiration for this piece. I made a human heart shaped box out of copper to hold a jar of needles. And this is the outside look of the heart. And this image of a hand holding the heart um, I want to convey that the heart is getting poisoned by a pessimistic dark energy, and that's how depression is started. The second piece, agony. This is the worst stage of depression, as you have no control over your life because you're slowly losing the desire to live. You would cry so often because everything hurts inside, even breathing. And sometimes you would cry without even knowing. But at some point, crying can't even help to express your overwhelming emotions anymore. The pressure can build up and become unbearable. You would try to end your life, but it's too difficult because it's actually, it actually takes a lot of courage to do so. Therefore, you would hurt your body as a way to express the thoughts and feelings you can't say aloud. As I mentioned in my artist statement, moths are suicidal as they are drawn to flames. They know it will kill them, but it doesn't stop them from flying to one. For that reason, I used the moth for this piece. I also added chains on it as a symbol of torture and agony. And I don't know if you can tell, but I actually used makeup to make myself look skinnier as to show some of the people who suffer from depression can also suffer from anorexia.
the third piece. Um, okay. In between the worst episodes, you would pretend that you're okay since you still have to live your life no matter how much you don't want to. You put on a mask to show people that you're okay because you want you want to avoid all the, the overwhelming questions from them. Like, what happened? Are you okay? You seem off. But deep down inside, you know for a fact that you're broken. So I got inspired to make this wall piece. I made a hybrid of a moth and a butterfly for this piece as you are so confused from not knowing if you're truly okay or not okay. On the front, you can see she's shining as she's uh, she's shine shining as she seems fine on the outside. But I made a mirror to reflect her true self on the inside. From the shattered mirrored pieces, you can see the back of her is dark and is broken. It shows that she is having all these messed up th thoughts in her mind when people think that she is okay. The fourth piece, recovery. After battling for a long time, some people will eventually be capable of feeling better. Some take months, some take years, some take their whole life battling. But it, it, is it is possible as I have experienced myself before. Depression is definitely not something that's easy to fight. You might, you might have tried a thousand times and you would still feel helpless and defeated. However, never forget that you're loved. Your loved ones would want you to overcome this more than anything. You don't have to fight this alone. So try not to shut yourself off from them. Let them in, they'll accept you. Give them a chance to help you through it. I know it's hard, but don't be afraid to open up. You'll find unexpected, unexpected uh, results if you do. I made this earring using a wing of a moth from the bottom part, uh, for the bo bottom part, and added blood drips and chains indicating pain depression causes. And as a result of recovery, I used a butterfly wing for the upper upper part uh, of the earring, because as I mentioned, butterfly symbolizes transformation. And this piece uh, is a transition from a distressed moth transforming to a hopeful butterfly. And a final piece, reborn. As long as you don't lose faith, one day you'll conquer the emotional battle and become your true self again. Once you're fully recovered, you'll feel different. You'll feel stronger and tougher. And I promise you'll love the, this new version of you. I use butterfly as the subject for this necklace because butterfly does uh, do not only symbolize transformation. They also symbolize reborn. I made a butterfly with some angular pierced shapes and sharp edges indicating the tougher self I have become. And I also added the region and state flowers of the places I call homes to represent me, which are Utah, California, and Hong Kong. I am who I am today because of the things I've experienced and the people I've met from these three places. And I wouldn't be me if it wasn't for my homes. And this is the end. Thank you everyone for attending. I appreciate everyone of your time and support. And also nice to see you again, Olivia. I've checked, I've checked out your work and I love it, especially the raw collection. I love how you transform something raw into something elegant. And anyway, um, there's no words I can um, express how much I want to thank all, all of you, especially our amazing jewelry and metal arts faculties, Marilyn, Curtis, David, Deb, Russell, and Joanne. I love you guys. And lastly, thanks Andrea for his support. Thank you so much, Bowie. Um, if you could stop sharing and then we will have uh, Olivia. Sorry. I don't know. Oh, okay. Did it work? Yeah. Thank you so much for your honest account and your really depthful account of your experience. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Sorry, I was so yeah. nervous. No, you did great. <laughs>
Thank you. Hi, Bowie. Hello, Olivia. I wanted to start off by saying thank you for sharing your mental health journey with us. I know it's something that's not often talked about in East Asian countries and cultures. And I think it's really important that more people talk about it and becomes more normalized and just a part of our lives really, because it is part of our health. And mm -hmm. um, I also want to say that the vulnerability that you show in your work, I feel like that's really your strength. That's what sets you apart from other people because it is very hard to open up and let other people into your life. And this vulnerability will help you in whatever type of work you wanna do in the future. Which leads me to my next question is, what are your plans for after graduation? What type of direction are you interested in? Um, I think I am gonna try and start selling some of my work uh, online and I'll see where it goes from there. And I also think that, uh, that I want to get a certi certificate from GIA because they have a school here in Hong Kong. And um, I, I love gemstones and I think it's going to help with my career. So I think I'm going to do that next. Okay, got it. Um, so if we're talking about more wearable work, I think you could look at two of our alum. Um, the first one is Camille Torres. And I will same, send these names to Curtis later on, so you'll have them. Um, but she works a lot with butterflies and she does a lot of, um, I think mostly black and gold and some silver as well. She takes the butterfly wings and kind of transforms them into three dimensional shapes. And it's very interesting to see her work like evolve and um, kind of how she sets herself apart from other people who design with butterflies. I think that's important if you're looking to break into the jewelry industry. And mm -hmm. the second person also a CCA alum is Taylor Gadiker. Um, she worked a lot with moths, interestingly enough. And she actually loved moths and she would, I think, incorporate actual moths into her work at times and also make moth out of, moths out of metal and different materials. So I think these two people would be very interesting for you to look into. Sure. Um, I also really appreciated that you could have, you took that kind of narrative of caterpillar to butterfly and you switched it up and made it from moth to butterfly, which is very interesting to me because you took that idiom of um, the moth flying towards a flame and kind of the self-destructive nature of that and contrasted it with the butterfly that is going for metamorphosis. And um, that was very interesting to me. And then how you wove that into your whole narrative for your presentation, it was very complete. Um, let's see. I think for your, was it your first piece? Was it Agony or is it called Agony with the heart? A trauma. A trauma, uh, sorry. Trauma. Okay, so um, I really liked the patina technique you did on the outside of the heart. I feel like I don't see that often. I I know there is like um, a heat patina technique, but not a lot of people have used that in their jewelry. So if you decide to continue working with that patina, I think it could become something unique, like a signature for your work. And um, Thank what you. else was there? I feel like also there is something interesting in how you use the, the shattered mirror in your, I can't remember which one was it. Do you remember what the title uh, was? I'm okay. One? I'm okay, I'm yes. Okay. Yeah, so that was um, a really great use of reflection. And I, if you could somehow apply that to your jewelry, like wearable jewelry, that would also mm -hmm. set you apart. Having something, you see something and then you see the reflection, it's a different thing. Ha coming, having mm -hmm. that dichotomy and contrast. And let's see what oh. else. Um, and, oh yes. And I, I thought it would be great if you could also look at two other artists who work with butterfly floral mo motifs, but they also add their own signature look aesthetic onto it. So the first one is Wu Ching Chi. He's a Taiwanese artist and 
what he does is he does, um, he adds enamel to his pieces and he does cliquageur, I think that's what it's called, where it's just the enamel within like an empty window so the light can go through. Um, so he's a master at that and it has become his aesthetic and it really sets his butterflies and insects apart from everyone else. And the second person is Hang Li, also a Taiwanese artist. And he, what he does is he um, has a pixelated metal frame and then he embroiders inside of it. So he's joining mm -hmm. like traditional technique with modern pixelation, digital art. And I think it would be very interesting if you could find your own direction and apply it onto your butterflies. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. And uh, do you have any questions for me? Um, you will give all the names to Curtis, right? Yes, oh, definitely. I will email. I didn't know how to spell them. them. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much and congratulations on graduating. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Bowie and Olivia. Um, let's see. Great. I have the pleasure of introducing Ursula now. Um, Ursula is from Canton, China. She became interested in jewelry and metal arts when she took an elective course as an animation major. She's drawn, she was drawn in by the techniques and the hand process of metal smithing. Uh, this opened her eyes to see the relationships between the multiple medium, between multiple mediums and other ways of craft, crafting that could be a vehicle for her art. She's an avid reader, and she draws inspiration from literature, films, painting, and cra other craft-based practices. She uses object making as an opportunity to build narratives in many forms. In her presentation, you'll see how the passage of time and storytelling are central to her works. Ursula is passionate and prolific with her ideas and her ability to produce. You're only going to see a small slice of the many ideas and bodies of work that she's produced in the last few semesters. Congratulations to all the work that you produced during your time at CCA. Welcome, Ursula. Thank you, Curtis. I got to share my screen. Yeah. Let's see. Sorry. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Um, are you seeing the, the big screen or the small one? I'm not sure. Oh, we are seeing your name with senior project from Weixin Hong. Okay, um, that's the right one. Um, hello, um, everybody. Um, I'm Wei Xing Huang, and I go by Ursula. Um, my major is um, both jewelry, metal arts, and animations, and this is my senior presentation. Um, I started my journey of art since I was young. My family, none of my family interested or work for art. Most of the family are working related to business. But surprisingly, I showed a little bit talent on art when I was young. I was concentrated on drawing since I was young. My parents sent me to learn how to draw in order to not let me watch TV for a long time. So this is how I started. And before my junior year, I was only focusing on animation. And um, I took Marilyn's Jewelry One for elective courses by chance. And learning craft making enriches my understanding of art. So from then, I was attracted by how jewelry. Um, sorry, uh, from then I was attracted by jewelry. Thinking in two D drawings and three D craft making is so different. However, I see their inner connections of being a career of narration.
These are the artists that I recently looked at. Their works are mostly discussing the relationship between jewelry and body. By concentrating on the inner movement of the body, active them to keep them alive. And it is about discovering more possibilities of the materials. I was inspired by how they utilize different materials and how they translate human emotions into jewelry and performance. I was also inspired by the candy, candle rings, the first one, of how it uses wax as material to present a juxtapositions between mutation and stability, presence and absence, soft and hard, life and death. My works pay attention on human relationship. As I was born and raised in Chinese culture, where human relationship is important in life. I developed my interest of figuring out the principles and rules behind relationship and wonder what participated in building up the order, like taboos or customs that have lasted for a long time. Asking questions about human purpose behind what they talk, what they act in order to understand my own actions and emotions. I put my questions to interpretation through arts. This project is, my, is me putting my interpretation of why we need burial or what burial means to living people. Death is always a forbidden topic, a taboo in Chinese culture. People believe that to talk about death in daily life would bring bad luck, bad luck to us. But at the same time, there are complicated customs and rules of death to follow. When I was a child, I, was, I, was had, I always had impulse to break the rules. As I grew up, I began to discover more behind my rebellion and the rules. The contradictory and confusion led me to explore more about why that culture is important to us. This project contains installations and wearable pieces that made out of bronze, bones, resin, and wax to bleed and melt. The wax solid melts over two hours on average, liberating the large installations that were sealed beneath. I grind bones to powder and mix up the bones, the, the powder of bones with resins and pour them into, into the mold they have already made by clay and silicone. I, my interest of exploration of burial came from my own family. It was asked to worship to my ancestor twice a year since I was young. I always thought it was bone ashes that we are visiting, but there's a time that my grandma told me it was bones, um, the real bones instead of the ashes, so that I um, began to hold curiosity about uh, the formations and history of the customs. So basically bone collecting is uh, one of the ancient secondary burial rituals that practice in China. The ritual is still ongoing um, now. Um, to bury the bone of that more than twice in different places are distinct characteristics of bone collecting. Mm -hmm. Uh, among Cantonists, the standard practice of, of bone collecting involves unearthing a coffin with a dead body that has been buried for at least five years and leaving the coffin partly open in order to let out of stench. Okay, as the stench became bearable, the dead person's offspring would, using Cantonese formally, ask the dead people, ask the dead person to wake up. After some rituals, the bone collectors a person trying train to be the ritual. Sorry, it's why is sorry. After some ritual, the bone collectors, a person trained to do this ritual, will respectfully and carefully collect the bones from the coffin. The next step involves cleaning and drying the bones, which usually takes at least four to five days. And the final part of the ritual depends on the offspring's will. They may want to grind the bones into ashes or put them in containers called golden towels. So my family's case is they put they put them all the bones into containers um, uh, that cause golden uh, towers and put them into countryside or cemetery and for the peaceful rest. So I worked to utilize metal and bones to imitate the whole process of the special burial ritual. The shapes of the installation represent the graves and the little vessels that made out of bones and resin is the representation um, for the vessels used to contain the collected bones. So I got to play the videos 
of the process. I also, <clears throat> I also collected people's writing of their memories and used laser cut to print them out. The hammering, then hammering them into shape to fit in the containers. People write down what is important for them at the moment or what was important for them, but it has lost already in order to keep their memories well. What carries people's memories as still do, still doing the jobs of connecting people with their memory, just the same as the practice relating to that or rather to the connections between the living and the dead. By having people participated in, which to record their memories or lost that people hope to keep with them and go through the ritual, death became no longer forbidden topics in new, in new interpretation of tradition. One of the important reasons that people were doing bonds collecting is people didn't want to leave their family behind at the time they were forced to travel around due to the war and the famine. So they figured out a solution to carry the bonds of their family instead of the whole body. Therefore, I created wearable pieces as the presentations of people's memories to their family. No matter what kind of practice family do for, do for the dead, the order is to keep, communicate, keep communicating with the dead and in being connected with the spirit. Perhaps the custom of the deaf and dead people is the most everlasting one among all customs. Therefore, though the social environments, principles, and beliefs have, ch have changed, those that related custom vary slowly. The customs of death is highly associated and influence our daily life. To be asked to be able to talk about death is a very important step for us to understand what is meant to us. And um, these are my other works. Um, working animations, the main topics is about how to build up your stories and which includes how to set up cameras, timing, and especially editing. During my journey in jewelry, the way to develop narration in best in my works. Narration is always the core of the creation. In my three years of learning in metal arts, the exploration of combining narration with crap making never stopped. These works originated in films and stories, created installations of wearable pieces to translate the camera languages and abstract emotions into actual pieces. The crucial part of filming is about where to set your camera, including what, what you want to put in your footage and the compositions that you make. I extracted the phenomenons and elements in the film and see how they can react to materials. Instead of technical consideration, materials speak for their own stories as characters in the play. There are the miniatures of my five years college life. It started from meadows, it's the only material for me, developed to engage in clay, enamel, incense, glass, and metal to create pieces. My recent works of, of exploration for the relationship, relationship with human body in order to break the boundary between objects in human body. I consider human body as characters or material who plays together to build up the narration. Jewelry is my lens through which to show the dynamic process and materials or characters that carry personification. The handmade process inspired me how story could be told how narrations could vary through materials with the influence as diverse backgrounds, both working animation and jewelry. I try to combine the elements of time, visual presentations, performance, and interactions to my works. I hope by exploring this idea, I can better understand myself and give audience a deeper look into my thoughts and current experience. And thanks for listening and thanks for joining. Um, this is all my presentation, thank you. Thank you so much, Ursula. Um, we now invite Olivia to respond. If you can stop sharing, that would be great. Okay. Do I stop? Yeah. Hi, Ursula. Hi. Hi. Um, Are you able so to turn your video on, Ursula? Oh, oh I forgot that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, hi, you have a different hair color. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it looks great, by the way. So my the first thing I wanna talk about is I, I really loved how you're talking about human relationships. 
sort of the unspoken rules and like private motivations and like how society is woven together. Um, that is also very interesting to me as well. And, um, but before we get into that, I wanted to ask what are your plans for after graduation? Um, I'm applying for the master degree um, now. Um, and I want to explore more about like the narration part of my jewelry. How could I explore this, um, explore like, how do I, how can I explore more, um, um, the jewelry carries more uh, narrations and how I can add more depth into the narrations. Like now it's only like um, the stable, uh, no, no stable, like it's not moving, like, because I was asked about um, how do you, um, how would you combine your two majors of this? Like, how do you combine animations and jewelry? So I think it's not about like, um, a lot of people would think oh, you're doing stop motion or that kind of things to, to use um, actual pieces into animation, but I don't, I, I don't think so. Um, I don't think it's the only way to do that. So I think like using um, different materials or like having um, narrative based work is also the combinations um, of um, stories and the craft making. So I want to continuing doing things like that. And are you thinking of more of working specifically within jewelry or also within like with objects and like sculpture, not just with jewelry? Um, <laughs> I think it depends like what stories I want to tell. <laughs> it's not, yeah. Got it. Um, speaking about narration, I think it came through very compellingly in your piece, piece um, based on the collection of bones um, during the burial process. The use of wax to me was very, very interesting. And it did bring up ideas of sort of um, stability and chaos and life and death and kind of like loss and gain and all of those transitional things in life. So I feel as if this material like worked to your advantage, would love to see more pieces where you incorporate wax or other types of materials that are um, not long lasting, for example, mm -hmm. ice, I don't know, um, things that kind of change over time, I think would be a bonus to your work. And then also, so I wanted to ask about that piece with that you're talking about, like the bones and the, the wax. Could you talk a little bit more about what the, I'm assuming that was bronze, the bronze section oh. on the bottom and the pieces on top. Can yeah. you talk more about that? Um, it's basically, um, the, the bronze is for the supporting part. So mm -hmm. um, it was basically um, this full part of the supporting part. Um, and I use it's all made out of um, like Holover techniques. So I hammered them out. So um, they're not doing like any um, meaningful, I mean, <laughs> but just like supporting, but the shape of them comes out of the, the grave. And the bones of that, um, a little bit containers of that, it's just for me when I when I was doing it, it's for me just like the representation of like they are they are different people that, that carries like different um, memories. So they are separated and they are, um, so I, I bought the bones that um, usually um, people would fat their pets and grind their, um, the gr and grind them bones to powders. And so they're in fine. So I can mix up with the, the rhythm and when the rhythms and um, the bones, like you, um, it lasted one day or two and they are solidified and you can like just pull them out. So they are already solid and, and in the shape. And then- So, oh, sorry, keep going. Uh, no, and then the wax part is just like the normal wax that people will use. So you just mount, mount them and just pull them and to cover the whole piece and just leave them, yeah, to melt. 
I was very impressed by that piece because it had so many different elements and it had a temporal element as well. And um, I did get the sense of bone and structure from the, the bronze, I think the bronze section. And there were the, the sort of individuality to each piece of bone and resin that you had created. Um, I think it would be interesting if you, if that piece, there were like 10 of them, <laughs> like they filled up a room or something. I know that's a lot of work, but I would have loved to see it in like a large scale and just, um, and then you could maybe play with different scents of wax or different wax that melt at different speeds, I guess. Um, it would add more layers to your work. And um, when, you when you present that work, would you have like an explanation nearby about bone collection or not? Or no, just like the title and materials? How would you present it? Um, I have the explanation. <laughs> OK. I, I wrote in them, yeah. OK. And I think your sort of exploration into burial traditions is also very interesting. A lot of people, I think not just in East Asia, but also in um, America, death is still a very taboo topic, which is a lot, why a lot of people don't have complete wills or like properly written um, wills and it ends up in fights or conflict over inheritance and things like that or more medical bills because um, your family members don't know what your last wishes were um, regarding medical procedures and it ends up in really astronomical bills. So I think it's it's also very important to talk about the, the process and get in touch with it, I think. Um, like I was talking about mental health to have it normalize. Well, I would love to see more of that in your work if you're interested. Yeah. Um, what else I wanted to say? Oh, so I do have some artists that I thought of that I think would be of interest to you. The first is Violet Wiener. And I think she mostly makes things out of um, silicone and pubic hair. Um, and she talks a lot about uh, like puberty and sort of the body. The interesting thing is that she does use like materials from the body, like you do like bones. So that would be an interesting person to look at. And also, I don't know if you ever took a class from her, but um, Angela Hennessy, who I believe is a faculty member at CCA, um, she works a lot with grief and mourning and hair. Mm -hmm. um, and her work, I think, would be, serve as uh, inspiration for you, too. So definitely check out those two artists. And what else? Let's see. Oh, and then about the last couple of pieces that you showed that kind of incorporated different materials, I enjoyed how you were just like experimenting with the enamel, the clay, the metal, and then combining them. Um, I feel like that has a lot of potential. It does look like it's still a little bit in process, but I'm excited to see what comes out at, on the other end. And I think the looser you can keep it, the better before you actually come to the, your final product. Because for me, at least the abstraction in your work is your strength. Like I can feel the emotion out of that abstract work you did. And yeah, do you have any questions for me? No, thank you. Okay, well, congratulations. That was very impressive. Thank you so much. Great, Can, thank you so much, Olivia, for corresponding to all the amazing presentations that we've had. Um, so appreciated. Um, you guys all did so fantastic. We're all so proud of you. Um, that is the conclusion of our BFA conversations. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. We had some, have some great guests and um, please, uh, this is your last chance to add anything in the chat if you'd like to add anything in the chat. And uh, thank you all so much. So if you want to just take a minute and unmute yourself to clap and uh, congratulate them, I think they'd all appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>